Amen. Okay, keep your place there in Matthew chapter 18. We're going to get to uh, Matthew chapter 18 in just a few minutes. Uh, but first, I want to just say welcome to the Making Sense sermon series. I've been thinking about um, putting this um, sermon series together for the last uh, several months, maybe six months or more, and I was just kind of just waiting for what I thought was the right time, and, and maybe um, now is the right time, maybe it's not. But let me just give you a little bit of an introduction on how we're going to do this. So this is a sermon series on biblical advice for your financial future, for your finances in your life. The Bible talks about everything that you need to know um, in your life, and finances are no different. The Bible does talk about how you are supposed to be a steward for your finances. So the way I want to run this series is I want to start each sermon with kind of a Bible study on the topic that we're looking at, and then I'm going to give you some actual very practical advice on um, the topic at hand at the end of each sermon. So with that being said, um, you know, this is meant to be something that actually you can put into practice in your life, something that will actually help you. I don't want to just give you a Bible study and just throw that out at you and just let you figure that out for yourself. I want to give you some very practical advice along with these um, sermons and these Bible studies. And it, just let me say this, you know, as when it comes to actual financial advice in your life, you know, look, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not here to be your financial advisor. But let me just say this. When you are seeking out um, financial advice in your life, you should ask people that have had some financial success in their life. So you young people, you know, if you're looking at, you know, advice on, on how to run a business, you should probably look for a brother and sister in Christ who maybe has a successful business. You know, things like that. Don't just be bantering it amongst yourselves and think you're going to find things out because, look, there's a lot of very complicated mechanisms and hoops to jump through with whatever it is that you decide to pursue in your life, and people have figured this out. People amongst you have figured this out, so it's okay to ask questions and ask for that advice from the right people, okay? Don't ask somebody who's completely broke and has been a financial failure in their life for financial advice. It makes sense, right? All right, now, um, let's get right into it. So this, the topic th this evening in the very first sermon of the Making Sense series is probably the most serious and probably the most dangerous for you. Okay, so this is a topic that we're going to talk about the, tonight, especially as young people, if you get this wrong, it could literally ruin your life. You could, real, you could really ruin and set yourself back for several years, if not, you know, decades, like many people do, if you get this one wrong. So what I want to talk about this evening is the topic of debt. I want to talk, talk about the to topic of debt. So first of all, the definition of debt is pretty obvious. It's owing something or somebody money, mainly, um, anything really, but it's the state, if you're in debt, you're in the state of owing money, okay? You say, I'm in debt, that means you owe. You owe somebody or some entity money. So let's look at what the Bible says. Look at Matthew chapter 18, which is where you're at, and I want to look down at the parable put forth in verse number 23, where it talks about, you know, this king. And I, I'm not going to get into the doctrine of the parable, but I do want to read through this very quickly for you, so you can see just a couple things I want to point out about debt and the consequences of debt. Look at Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 23. The Bible says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. So here was the one of his servants that owed him uh, a good sum of money. He owed him money. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. Now look. I'm going to explain this to you as well, and if you want to look up um, the Civil War sermon, that will explain um, to you um, what the servitude in the Bible is all about. But this is very biblical here, okay, in verse number 25. This is very biblical that you are to look. Servitude in the Bible is not the slavery of the 16 and 17 and 1800s in the United States, okay? That was man stealing, and I explained all of that in um, that that sermon series on the civil or that sermon on the civil war please check that out but servitude to pay off debt in the bible 
is very fair. It's very biblical, okay? Now look at verse number 26. So this guy owed money, and his Lord said, you know, sell him. You know, he needs to be sold. He needs to work that off. Look at verse number 26. And he was also, you know, to go with his family, by the way, which was different than also the man-stealing of the slavery. You know, it, it's, you know pe these people, I don't want to go off on this because this isn't what the sermon is about, but slavery of the 16 and 17 and 1800s in the Americas has really ruined the biblical philosophy of the servitude of the Bible. Okay, so stealing people from, you know, wherever and forcing them into labor is not what the Bible, the Bible says that man stealing is punished by death. Okay, so this is quite different and it will see that it's fair. Okay, so he's to pay off his debt. That is the, the origin of this, this punishment. Look at verse 26. The servant, therefore, fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. But the same servant, and so the, basically in the next couple of verses, he forgives him the debt. He has compassion on him. And then in verse number 30, the, the Bible says, and he would, uh, look at verse 29, and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went, okay, so let me just read the whole thing. I'm sorry, I skipped a couple of verses. Then the Lord of his servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So he was forgiven because his boss, his Lord had, met, had uh, mercy on him, verse 28. But the same servant that was forgiven went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. So it was just a tiny fraction of what he owed the, the Lord, what he was forgiven. And he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not but went and cast him into prison. So I want to focus on that part of the verse 30 where it says he cast him into prison. And I also want you to focus on verse 25 where he was to be sold with his wife and his children for his debt. And then his fellow servants saw what was done. They were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And then in verse 34, this Lord was wroth. So think about it. He forgave this huge debt to this man and then he went out and just threw someone in prison that owed him a fraction of that debt to himself. He did not show the same mercy. That's the doctrine here. We're not going to get into that, but look at verse 34. And this Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. I want you to notice that part right there. So um, I just want to show you the extreme punishment for debt that was laid out in Matthew chapter 18. So he was to be sold into servitude, number one. He was to be cast into debtor's prison, number two. And then number three, he was to be delivered to the tormentors, you know, that would obviously, the, the implication is that he would be forced to work off his debt, okay? So you say, you know, this sounds harsh, right? Like debtor's prison, but let me just uh, give you a, an example. I mean, debtor's prison used to be a real thing, especially in Europe. A debtor's prison is a prison for people who are unable to pay debt. Through the mid-19th century, that's up into the middle of the 1800s, debtors' prisons, usually similar in form to locked workhouses, were a common way to deal with unpaid debt in Europe. Destitute persons who were unable to pay a court-ordered judgment would be incarcerated in these prisons until they had worked off their debt via labor or secured outside funds to pay the balance. The product of their labor went towards both the cost of their incarceration and their accrued debt. So, so much for free meals in prison, right? I mean, you were literally to pay for your own care and then pay off the debt. Increasing access and lenience throughout the history of bankruptcy law made, the, made prison terms for unaggravated indigence obsolete over most of the world. So this is kind of what's considered old-fashioned now. But look, I just want to point out that debt that unpaid debt used to get you thrown in prison. Okay? Now what does the Bible say? Turn to Numbers chapter 30. What does the Bible say about debt? Actually, you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 15, and I will read for you Numbers chapter 30 in verse number 2. Numbers chapter 30, and well, first of all, you know, Numbers chapter 30 verses 1 through 30 has all these rules for vows and promises made. And in Numbers chapter 30 and verse number 2, the Bible says this. It says, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, and then it says, Or swear an oath 
to bind his soul with a bond. He shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So many people look at the first part of this verse and say, okay, if you promise something unto God. But then it says, at the very last part of this verse, it says, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond. You know what that says? You know what that means? That means he promises a bond is an IOU. A bond is a, you know, is a, is a certificate of, of debt. Okay, he says, if you swear an oath, you know, to, to pay a, a debt, you know, you shall not break your word. The Bible is saying here in Numbers chapter 30. Now look down at Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15 is talking about servitude and how this servitude is to be um, executed amongst brothers and sisters in the nation of Israel. Look, God, look, God is pragmatic. Okay, God in his law is pragmatic. What does that mean? That means that God tells people what is good and what is bad, but he also gives very detailed instructions on how to go about prosecuting life because he knows that people are going to do things that get themselves in trouble. Okay, look at Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse number 1. And the Bible says, At the end of seven, every seven years thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, but that which is thine with thy brother thine hand shall release. Save when there shall be no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the, God, which the Lord thy God had giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee. So he's saying, he's saying, look, he's like, except in times, you know, when you're incredibly blessed. He's like, because if you follow all the commandments of the Lord, what are we learning about in Judges? If you follow all the commandments of the Lord, you're going to be greatly blessed as a nation. And then he's, he's like, you're not even going to have to worry about, you know, borrowing anything. Because people that are blessed, you know, don't have to borrow anything. Look at verse number 6. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow, and thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. Now, no, verse number 6 is very interesting. Okay, because verse number six basically says that a nation that lends unto other nations is greatly blessed. Okay, a nation, and then uh, the nation that, that borrows to other nations also reigns over those nations. You see what that says, how it ties those two things together? Now look, what does that imply about the nation that is borrowing the money? What does that imply about, you know, the situation where you are borrowing from somebody? As a nation, that implies that you are in servitude to the nation that you are borrowing from. And that you are not in God's blessing. More on that a little bit later. Okay? But look, the first Bible lesson I want to tell you, or want to give you about debt, turn to Deuteronomy chapter, thir chapter 23. Just a few uh, pages over in your Bible. The first Bible lesson I want to give you this morning about debt is this. Debt in the Bible is always bad. Okay? Debt in the Bible is always bad. You will never find a verse in the Bible that says debt is good. And we could get into salvation and talk about it this way as well. But even from a monetary standpoint, debt in the Bible is bad. God even lays forth rules. But like I said, God is pragmatic. He knew that people were going to borrow from each other. So he even lays forth rules for borrowing. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 23. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. You're saying, what in the world is that? What he's saying is, amongst your brothers and sisters in Christ, you are never supposed to charge interest to anyone. Okay? If, if Brother George is in... I'm sorry, brother, you sat in the spot. I'm going to use you as every example. That's the spot. I'm left-handed. So that's just the way it works. Now, if Brother George wants to borrow $100 from me, that means that he's my brother in Christ. It would be wrong, according to the Bible, for me to charge him interest on that. 
to say, all right, here's $100, and if you don't pay me back in a month, you owe me $105. It doesn't say that, that you could, even if it's a small amount, it's wrong to do that to a brother, okay? Now look, the, look at the Bible in uh, verse number 20 of Deuteronomy 23. Unto a stranger thou may, uh, mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury. That the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand, to in the land where thou goest to possess it. So look, it's just giving some, some instructions on debt there. They knew that they were going to be, God knew that they were going to be borrowing from each other. He's saying, hey, amongst each other, don't be charging interest. You know, don't be opening up the Bank of Israel and charging interest to all your brothers and sisters. He's like, that's wrong. That's not how I want you to make money. Okay? But look, it's still never considered a good thing, debt in itself. So the second Bible lesson, the first one is debt is bad. Very simple. The second Bible lesson is this. Turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. The second Bible lesson is this. Debt is inversely proportional to freedom. You know what that means? That means as your debt goes up, your freedom goes down. They're inversely proportional. As your debt goes down, your freedom goes up. That's what the Bible teaches. You say, but slavery is illegal today. Well, just listen. You say, I'm free. But look, servitude in the Bible is based largely on debt. Deuteronomy 15 is talking about people that owe money to other people. Look at Proverbs 22. They're simply working off their debt. Turn to Proverbs 22. Look at verse 7. The Bible says this. The Bible says, the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Look at Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 26. The Bible says this, be, not, be thou not one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debts. This is saying, hey, don't sign for somebody else's debts either. You shouldn't do that. Don't be a surety. That means if you know, a brother in the church says, hey, I want to you know, do this, but I can't, I'm not supposed to go sign, you know, be a co-signer for debt for anybody. Because what will happen in verse 27, it says, if thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? Because if he doesn't pay, they're going to come for me. They're going to come and they're going to take away my bed from me and my family. Okay? So look, look. Listen very carefully here. If you owe somebody money, they have power over you. It is that simple. You are in servitude towards that person. You want, I mean, you want to make yourself a modern day servant? Get into debt. Turn to Exodus chapter 21, or Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22. So first of all, in Exodus chapter 21, you're going to go to Exodus chapter 22, but Exodus chapter 21 is talking about the rules of servitude. So the, the Bible knew that people would end up in servitude towards each other because they would owe money. They would have to pay back that money. Okay, they knew that God knew that people would get in that situation. So in Exodus 21, God gives some very specific rules on how you were to be treated as a servant, how you were to treat people that were in servitude towards you. Now, look at uh, verse number, Exodus chapter 22, and verse number 1. In Exodus chapter 22, with all those rules in mind on servitude because of owing people money, look at verse number 1 of Exodus 22. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall be no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen on him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make... Okay, now listen to this. Because, because he should make full restitution. And if he, have, if he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. So if I steal something from Brother Phil, I have to pay him back five times or four times what I stole from him. And if I don't have, if he doesn't kill me in the dark when I'm stealing from him, then I, and I don't have the money to pay the four times restitution or the five times restitution, I'm to be sold for the debt because that's debt that I owe at that point. Okay? I don't owe, oh, sorry, I, st I, I tried to steal your sheep and I failed. Here's your sheep back. No, I owe four sheep. 
I owe four sheep because I tried to steal his sheep. So you say, you say, what? It's like no one, you know, no one should be in servitude to anyone. You know, justice for all. You know, no one should ever serve anyone in the new modern world. Well, look, folks, this is, this is natural law, is what I want to get across to you this evening. This idea that if you owe somebody something, that you will be in servitude to them no matter what the laws are. Is there debtor's prison today? There is not debtor's prison today. But look, you will serve until you've paid the debt in Israel or until that seven years is up and then you're freed. That was the law in Israel, whichever comes first. You know, you say, so look, look, here's the thing. What if we had a society where nobody had to repay anything? What if we had this society where everybody just got to not pay their rent, not pay their debts, everything's just free? What would happen? Now look, follow me with linear thought here for a minute. Let's connect linear thought with like two dots. Who in the world? This is why it's natural law. This is why it doesn't matter if you think it's fair. This is just the way it will always work. Okay? Let's say that, that nobody ever had to repay anything. Let's say that if you could just go and you could take out a loan, and if you just decided not to pay, just whatever. Whatever, man. It's, it's cool. Sorry, bro. I, I didn't mean to take the $200,000. I'm just going to, everything was fine. There was no consequences. Who in the world would borrow money to anybody? Let's say that you just never really had to pay rent. That, you know, it was more of a suggestion. That we suggest that you pay $800 a month. And there's no consequences for not paying your rent. Who in the world would rent to people? What kind of crazy person would go into that kind of business? So guess what? You would have like nobody renting. And the few idiots that did rent would be charging massive prices for rent is what would happen. Okay, so your rent wouldn't be $800 a month. It'd be $8,000 a month. And the same thing would happen with loans. Nobody would want to give loans and the people that did would charge 100% interest and they would just, it would be loan shark type stuff. Because nobody in their right mind, look, the more honest people there are that pay debt according to what the Bible says, the, the cheaper rent will be, the cheaper interest rates will be, it, it's just the more available those types of things will be. It's that simple. And that's, that's natural law. Okay, that's natural law. And you know, if nobody's giving loans, have fun saving up $200,000 in cash for a house. Good luck. Or have fun, you know, saving up $30,000 for a car and going in and writing a check for that as it comes out of your checking account. Look, it simply doesn't work. It simply would never work. The Bible, but back to debt and servitude. This is just the way it works. Debt and servitude, they go together, okay? It's not, it's not because society is mean. It's not because society is mean. It's because that it's natural law. It's, the natu it's one of the natural laws of economics. It's just the way things work. So look, meaning like gravity. You're like, What's, uh, uh, that's another law. It, it just works that way. It's very simple. It can't be changed no matter what you think. Okay? So debt and servitude go together. That is the second lesson from the Bible. The third lesson. Turn to Psalm chapter 37. Psalm chapter 37. The third lesson is this. Not repaying, and, and it's perfect that, you know, this would be a lesson in the Bible because it keeps things in balance. The third lesson is this. Not repaying debt is wicked. Amen. Not repaying debt is wicked. Going and, you know, signing a bond and then not keeping your word and not doing that is wicked, right. the Bible says. Look at Psalm 31 and verse number 21. I can't tell if the stage is, is, is cracking or if someone's shooting at us. But either way, there's something popping up here, so I think it's, it, I think it's up, up here. But anyway, Psalm 37, um, verse number 21, look what the Bible says. It says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. I mean, that's pretty straightforward right there. If you borrow from people and don't pay back, that is wicked. 
I mean, you're actually a wicked person. It doesn't say, hey, you're acting wicked. It says that's what the wicked do. Now, let me ask you a question. Can saved people do wicked things? Absolutely. Absolutely. So don't be a wicked person. The Bible says that borrowing and paying not again is wicked. People today say, I'll just borrow and I'll just not repay. But look, here's what, and well, here's the thing. If you go out and you do that, first of all, you'll lose those items. There will be consequences to you. We'll talk about a little bit later. But here's the thing. No, I mean, and there's no debtor's prison here, but no one's going to, no one's going to borrow f to you in America for a long, long time if you operate that way. So you may be able to do that, you know, once. I've often made the joke with my wife. We used to get all kinds of credit card applications in the mail. I was like, let's just take them all out. We'll just take out like $100,000 in credit cards, and then we'll just move to a different country. You know, we'll have a really good time for like, you know, I don't know, how long would it take to spend that kind of money? A week? And then we'll move to another country. I'm joking, of course. But look, that may work one time. But look at, I'm going to read for you again, Numbers chapter 30 and verse number 2, where the Bible says, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. But look, some people still operate this way. Some people still operate this way. But here's the thing. Christians, you forget the God factor. You forget the God factor. Because honestly, I mean, if I borrow $100 from Brother George and I don't pay that back, that's kind of like, I mean, what have I done to him? It's kind of like stealing. As a matter of fact, it's no different than stealing. It's not kind of like it. It's the same. It's the same in the eyes of God. That's why in Exodus 22, it's the same rules for the thief. You see where I'm going with this? Look, the Bible would say that I should work that off. You know why? Because if I borrow $100 from Brother George, and I just don't have $100, I don't have anything that's worth $100, guess what? I still have something that's worth $100. And this is forgotten in America today. You know what I have? I have my labor. I have my arms and my legs. I can go and I can mow his lawn for $15 a, a shot until it's all paid off. I mean, that's the Bible way. Look, the Bible makes more sense than anything that we're doing today. However, the U.S. today will just let people get away with it. It just lets people get away with it. Okay, you'll suffer with your credit score. And, but look, you still stole. You still stole, Christian. You still stole Bible-believing Christian. You know, you forget, and so many times we, we just go by what the rules of our society say, and we forget the God factor in our life. So look, what do we see? I mean, the Bible's pretty clear on debt. I mean, this is not complicated stuff, right? Debt is bad. Debt is servitude. Whether you like it or not, whether you think it's fair or not, whether or not there's debtor's prison or not, debt is is servitude. That's it. It's natural law. And not repaying is wicked. Amen. Those are the three things that I need you to understand. Now, what is the practical application here? What is the practical application? How do we take these three things and operate in our lives and function in our lives? So here's the practical application. All right. I mean, look, this could be the sermon right here. Never go in debt. Let's pray. That could be it. Right? That could be the practical application. But look, there's several problems with this. Okay? We live, you and I and all of us in this room, we live, unfortunately, in a debt-based society. We live in a debt-based society. It would actually be very difficult for most people running a business, most people doing things in their everyday life, wherever they're living, to not be in some sort of debt the way our society operates today. Look, money that is literally created today is debt. Did you know that? Did you know that your money is debt? You're saying, you mean money gets me into debt? Or money, could, no, your money, your money, your money, here's a dollar bill. Your money, this is not money. This is debt. You say, what? This is a bond. This is money that the U.S. government owns. Go, out, go ahead and look at the next time you have a dollar, what does it say at the top? Does it say gold certificate? 
Does it say this represents one ounce of gold? This is a, they used to say silver certificate on, on the dollars, but it says Federal Reserve note is what it says. This is a note representing one dollar of debt that the U.S. government owns, owes. Okay, our money is debt. Our country, Deuteronomy 15, 6, I'll read it again for you. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. He's saying, look, he's like, you are going to be greatly blessed, which means you will lend unto nations and you will not borrow. But look, our country is run on debt, is run on borrowing. Okay, so look, here's how it works. I'm just going to break it down real quick for you. Look, the government needs money. Okay, why does, I mean, you say, why does the government need money? Well, the government needs money because they spend more money than they bring in. Okay, so when you spend more than you bring in as income, which we're going to talk about in coming weeks, you will be in debt. You will have a, a misbalance there and you'll be in debt. So the government needs money. Our government operates different than you should. They need money, so the government outsources their creation of money to what's called the Federal Reserve, which is basically a conglomeration of private banks. Okay? The Federal Reserve is not a government agency. Okay? The government creates an IOU in the form of a government bond. Somebody buys this government bond. Many different people buy this government bond, including foreign nations, by the way. And the Federal Reserve credits the money to usually banks in the U.S. that, you know, as the government, as the Treasury Department sells the bond. That's how it works. And then through, I mean, we're not going to get into this, but through fraction, I mean, so the government has just created a dollar of debt, and then we put it into this banking system, and it magically creates ten dollars into the economy. And that's a whole thing that you've got to look into. Okay, but basically, by the government selling one dollar in debt, and by this fancy fractional reserve banking system that we have, one dollar of debt created by the government magically turns into ten dollars out in the, in the world, out in the economy of the United States. Okay, it's basically, it's money out of thin air, but it's in the form of debt. Okay, now look, there's two problems with this. There's two problems with this. First of all, the U.S. government now owes the money. Our national debt in the United States is owned by the public, pensions, insurance companies, and foreign countries. Who thinks this is a good idea, to be in servitude to a foreign country? And many more. Look at Proverbs 22, 7 again. I mean, the rich ruleth, ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. And the second thing is this. Increasing the money supply in this fashion, creating 10 times more, you know, creating a trillion more dollars out into the economy, it literally robs you. The United States government, by doing this, is stealing from you. So you say, you know, so all you young people out there that are waiting for the next stimulus bill, let me just tell you, you should be against it. You're like, why? Because you're literally robbing yourself. You're like, oh, government, give me $1,200. They're, they're devaluing everything that you own. They're devaluing all your savings. Because as they dump all that extra money into the market, it devalues, you know, the money, it devalues how much this can buy. And you say, how? But look, the last 20 years, the, the value of the dollar has lost 50%. You can literally, you could literally buy, you can literally buy half of what you can, you could 20 years ago today with this. And you can see it in prices if you're paying attention and you're old. That's why prices, by the way, seem to always keep going up, because they are. Okay? It's not that the items are getting more expensive, it's that your dollar is getting less valuable. That's what it is. Okay, and it's against savings. I mean, think about this. Gold 20 years ago was $260 an ounce. Today it's $1,900 an ounce. It's the same piece of gold, it's just that a dollar is worth a lot less today. Okay, look, that's a 700% increase. Think of this a new Chevy pickup 10 years ago was 10 years ago, was $27,000. Today it's $44,000. 10 years ago. 
That's a 61% increase. That means 6% a year, your savings is just losing, 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 losing. Okay? So look, of course, you know, the government, the Federal Reserve will play this number down all the time, but the value of your money is being destroyed. And you say, who cares? Well, when you can no longer afford anything, you will care. And you say, I'm already there. Well, that's why it happened. That's why you can no longer afford anything. It's not because minimum wage is too low. It's because the value of the dollar has been destroyed. That's why. Okay, so look, debt, let's go back to the individual. Debt is bad. Debt is bad. You cannot operate like our country does. Okay, you cannot personally operate like our country does. I just had to go off on a little bit of rabbit trail there, but let's get back to the individual. Let's get back to how you can operate. And a lot of this, look, we're going to go into Jared's opinion land a little bit here, okay? But look, let's talk about debt within the bounds of the Bible, okay? Since we live in a debt-based economy, it would be very difficult to survive without having any debt in this country, okay? So let me just explain to you what a liability is and what an asset is, okay? So an asset, an asset is something that you own. A liability is something that you owe, okay? So an asset could be things like, you know, um, an asset could be like a house or even a car is an asset. You know, there's appreciating assets. So assets, I'm going to divide it into two categories. Appreciating assets are things like land, stocks, bank accounts, real estate, things like that. Those are things that appreciate. The value of those things tends to go up over time. And then there's depreciating assets. You own those things, but the value of them goes down over time. Furniture, cars. Don't get me started on cars. Cars, it's, a de it's an asset, it's something you own, but it depreciates. Eventually it will be worth zero, okay? Now liabilities are things that you owe, like bills, like loans, debt, and mainly, look, unsecured debt is debt that you just owe and you have nothing to show for. Debt backed by nothing, okay? Secured debt is something that is called, you know, is backed by assets that you have. Okay, so if you take out a loan for a car, your loan is backed by that car. Okay, now look, I'm going to give you some advice on debt you should avoid and debt that if you have to get into is, is less risky and not going to lead you into servitude. Okay, appreciating assets. Assets that you can own that appreciate in value typically, these are the things that are generally okay to have debt on that will not drive you into servitude. Meaning, if you wanna go and take out a mortgage on a house, that's not gonna be something that drives you into servitude. Look, because of dual incomes, the way the monetary system works in this country, it would be nearly impossible for someone to buy a home without taking a loan today, okay? But as long as you operate within the bounds of the Bible, look, Psalm 37 still applies meaning the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. As long as you, so I go out and I take out a mortgage on a house for $200,000 or whatever it is, I mean, I have to understand that I am promising to pay that back. As a Christian, that is the rules that I am under. I'm under legal rules in the United States, but a higher rule for me is that I have, I have promised to pay that back. Now look, debt for appreciating assets will generally not take you into slavery, into servitude, okay? I mean, think about it. Think about housing in California. In general, it increases by 5% a year. So in general, especially if you make a good down payment, you have very low risk there by taking out debt for that asset. If you can make the payment and you know, you're obligated and you're willing to accept that risk, then that's generally not going to drive you into servitude and it will probably generally end up making your net worth more in, in, the, in the long term. Okay, so look, this whole idea, let me just talk about this idea like in 2008 and 2009 when the market crashed and everyone's like, they took out a loan for a $200,000 house and suddenly it was worth $150,000. The market went down. And everyone just took the keys and threw them to the bank and said, ah, 
I'm not paying this anymore. That is not right. You promise to pay $200,000 for that house, and the, and the Bible says that the wicked borroweth and not, payeth not again. So, I mean, for the Christian, that doesn't work. And look, you say, well, you know, I lost my job and I just couldn't pay. Well, then you accept the risks and you accept the consequences of what happens with the credit and, you know, people not being able to give you a loan for several years, um, many, many years. It's just, it comes with the territory. Look at Psalm chapter 15. You are making a promise. So even if you do decide to go into debt on an appreciating asset, you can never forget that you are still making a promise to pay that back. You are making a promise. In Psalm 15, look at verse number 4. Look at what the Bible says. It says, In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. You know what the Bible is saying there? It's saying, look, when you sweareth, and it's something that's bad for you. Like, I took out a, I mean, I bought my house, and it was $200,000, and then next year, it was the whole thing crashed, and it was worth $100,000. The Bible says that, you know, the Lord honors those who swear to their own hurt and just, just pay that back anyway. Right. And look, that, the, that, that is what should be done. That is what is correct and right and changing, changeth not. Okay, I mean, it's just, so the whole idea of, it really irritates me, this idea of the evil banker. You know, this evil banker out there. You know, these evil bankers and all this kind of stuff. Look, it's a bunch of garbage. No one's forcing you to take out a loan. You know, no one is forcing you to sign a bond. No one is forcing you to do these things. You're making a promise, and you need to honor that promise. Housing drops, you lose your job, then you accept those consequences. That's the bottom line. So look, be appreciative of your country, by the way, because there's no debtor's prison here. Okay, the worst case, you can sell the asset and repay the debt. Or at least most of it. Worst case. All, but listen, listen very carefully now. All other debt will lead you to servitude. The only debt that will not is debt incurred for appreciating assets. And there's still risk there that you must accept. Okay? Now what are these types of debt that I'm talking about? Unsecured debt. You say, what's unsecured debt? A credit card is unsecured debt. Here's when you should get a credit card. Young people, listen to me. Write this down. Here's when I should get a credit card. Never, ever. You should never get a credit card ever. Young people, you should have a debit card. You should have a debit card, and because guess what? When I got zero dollars in my checking account and I go to buy a hot dog and some Cheetos, it doesn't work. If you get credit cards, look, I know I've heard many of you say, I need to get a credit card so I can get my credit score up. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Amen. Don't ever get a credit card. Amen. You will hurt your credit because you will end up with a bunch of debt for hot dogs and Cheetos that don't exist anymore. Don't do it. It will be, and look, it will be nothing but pain and suffering for you for years. Servitude. Servitude. You will not, you will not increase your credit score, you will increase your debt to income ratio is what you will do. That's what you will do. And you're like, I don't know what that is. Go get a bunch of credit card debt and then go sit down with a banker to try to get a loan for the house and he'll tell you all about what that is. You want to get a loan, you want to have a credit score, you want to do these things so you can buy a house one day, here's what you do. You save up money, you have some cash saved up. We're going to talk about that in future, future sermons here. And then you work at the same place for a long time. Like years, uh, not days or hours, or whatever. Years. They always ask you that. How long you work there? Oh, I don't know, like seven minutes. Oh, see you later. And I got this credit card, because, you know, I want a good credit score, and they will look up your credit history, and they laugh you out of the bank. They're all pointing at you laughing. Like, give me a break. Student loans? 
If you end up with a worthless degree or no degree, you know what that is? Unsecured debt. And that's worse because you can't get away from that. I mean, student loans, I mean, you, I mean, it's terrible. It's terrible to even think about it. I know some people that are in some serious trouble with student loan debt. Here's another thing. Debt, so debt backed by nothing. Unsecured debt, avoid at all costs. Never. Amen. Don't get a credit card, young people. Stay away from it. And here's another thing. Oh, it's zero interest. Yeah, I can go, you can buy anything on like zero interest right now. And then in a year and a half, it's going to be 18% interest. You will be buried in debt. You can take out debt for TVs. Let's talk about depreciating assets. You can, you can take out loans for TVs. You can take out loans for furniture. No payment for 18 months. Sounds good. Nice furniture. Everything right now. It will lead you to slavery. Let's talk about cars. It will lead you to servitude. It's natural law. You will be in servitude. You say, I don't believe you. Then go get all the nicest stuff. You don't do this. Go get all the nicest stuff you possibly want and then call me in five years and let me know. Cars. Depreciating asset. I have never had a new car. I could go, I could go to the Chevy dealership and, walk, and drive out with the nicest pickup truck that they have on the lot tomorrow. I would never, ever do something so stupid. Amen. Ever. Ever. I will never have a new car. I'm so proud to drive my piece of garbage that rattles and one door doesn't open. There's a constant list of things I have to fix on that car all the time. But it's like free for me. Amen. I own it. Right. Young people, here's what you need to do. Look, I'm telling you, y young people, a car can financially ruin you. I'm telling you, a car can financially ruin you. You say, how? Here's how. You go out, and let's say I'm, I'm a young person, and I make $14 or $15 an hour or whatever I make, and I want to get a nice car. And I go out, and I buy a $15,000 car, and I get a $300 a month payment. That seems pretty good. And then something happens to that car. Maybe I, you know, maybe I don't even lose my job. But say I, it's a used car, and then say something happens to that car, and I can't afford to fix it. Guess what? Does, can I call the bank up and say, hey, could you stop my payment because my car is broken? Nope. You're going to pay until that thing is paid for. Whether it's a pile of garbage sitting in your driveway or it's still working. They don't care. You promised. You promised to pay for, pay for that car a certain amount of money. Young people, you need to go find a $1,000 car. That's what you need to do. And then you need to save 1000 bucks and put it into when my car breaks fund because it's going to break, because mechanical things break. And when you fix it, it's going to break again. So if you just have, like, you're just stretched to the max and you have nothing, it's going to break. You're like, you're, 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 it's a ticking time bomb, your life, at that point. These cars break. They're depreciating assets. And guess what? If you don't take care of them, you don't fix them, you don't have money to fix them, then it's going to go to zero even faster. You got to take care of them. It's like the guy in the vineyard today. Look, you got to take care of the vineyard. Okay? If you buy a home and you don't take care of it, it literally can lose value. You take care of it and it will lose value less. It's the same thing with the car. Furniture, perishable items. This is why credit cards are so stupid. Pretty soon, you guys, you go out and you get credit cards. Pretty soon, you will have $1,200 in debt and there won't even be any Cheetos and hot dogs left. You ate it all. You ate $1,200. You're like, how is that possible? $1,200, you can eat it with Cheetos and hot dogs in like less than a year. No problem. You go out to eat. You're just like, I just got this money. The thing just keeps working, and it's, it's great. Until you have nothing to show for it, but you still owe the money. All these debts, these unsecured debts, should be avoided like the, the plague. I mean, look, it will drive you into slavery. You say, how? Because with the car loans with the credit card debt, with the furniture debt, with the TV debt. Well, you shouldn't have a TV anyway. Were you listening this morning? What are you doing buying a TV? Car repair debt. You can take out loans on brake jobs. I didn't even know this until like three months ago. You can finance a brake job on your car. Look, someone will run your credit and they will see all these debts. 
And when it comes to you wanting to buy a home or something that's actually smart for you to buy, you will not be able to. You will literally be in a hole that you can't get out of. And all you will be doing is making payments. Imagine going to work. Imagine this. Imagine going to work and working 40, 50, 60 hours a week for something that doesn't even exist anymore. You're literally making payments. I mean, you're literally going somewhere for 60 hours a week and you have to go there because you have to make these payments on things that don't exist in the world anymore. You've eaten them. You've driven them until they're not worth anything. You've, furniture is not worth anything anymore. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like servitude to me. Where you're forced to go there. And, and it's, not, it's not to pay off all the, the gold in your silo. It's to pay off things that don't exist. You're just making payments of things that you promised. And, and then rent is going to rise, and you're going to end up paying rent for the rest of your life, and, and you will just never be able to get a loan for an appreciating asset like a home. Are you listening, young people? Debt is weakness and servitude. It may feel good at first. Oh, I can have, and this is another problem with young people. Listen, you look around the church, you look around the church, and you look at the guys that can take, I had a conversation with one of the young men a few weeks ago, and some of the guys were getting together on a Saturday. He's like, I gotta work. And he's like, you go to work. Why? Because the guys that are getting together on Saturday, they don't have to work Saturdays. Why? Because I'm 43. You know, I mean, you gotta understand that you just can't have everything right now. You're like, oh, brother so-and-so, he's got a nice house, and he's got this, and he doesn't have to work weekends. Well, hey, go work 80 hours a week for 10 years and call me in the morning. Then you can not work Saturday. But right now, you got to pay your dues. Or dig yourself a hole. Pick one. Pick one. Look, you can ruin yourself. You can ruin yourself, young people. Look, our country. Our country should pay as it goes. But it doesn't. So should we. You need to avoid debt like the plague. I mean, it's, I mean honestly, it, it's the real pandemic in, in our country today. You know, and coronavirus is just making it worse, by the way. I think average debt, looking through things in this sermon, the average credit card debt in California was like $10,000. Average per household. So be careful. This servitude, this servitude that I'm talking to you about tonight, it is not, it's not policy. It's not something that Trump or Biden is going to make go away. It's not policy. It's natural law, meaning it's something that if you do things this way, if you operate your finances this way, it's going to happen to you. Like if I jump up in the air, I'm going to come back down. It's natural law. It's going to happen. So you just can't have everything right now. You just have to work hard right now. And look, it's more than just that. You have to make the right decisions right now. Because you can make decisions. That's why, that's why for the 60-year-old, you know, this type of preaching is a little bit less valuable than for the 18-year-old. Because 18-year-old, 19-year-old, 20-year-old, 21-year-old, the decisions that you make right now will echo, echo through your entire life. You could go out and just have a really good time spending and being stupid right now, and you could pay for that for the next 10 years. It's crazy. I mean, it's crazy the amount of damage that debt could do to you. And that's why the Bible talks about it the way it does. I mean, the borrower is servant to the lender. Hello? It's not complicated. Just take it seriously. Decisions that you make now will affect you. Look, it will affect you. It will affect your family. It will affect your future uh, of a family or not. I mean, how would you like to be a young man with $180,000 in debt? I know a young man like this. With $180,000 in debt, nothing to show for it, and go around being like, hey, would you like to get married? 
hey, hitch your, hitch your wagon to this mess. Let's go. I'm like, um, no thanks. He's not even that good looking. He's got no chance. I'm just joking. But the point is that, I mean, the point is, is that you could make a lot of decisions right now that destroy a lot of things for a lot of people for many, many years. So listen to what the Bible says about debt. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.